Hello, hello, girly pops. Welcome back to another episode of the Glow Girl podcast. I have a very special guest with us today. Um, Haley is a registered dietitian. You also, you specialize in like GI issues and hormone issues as well, right? Yes, okay. Mm making sure I don't mess this up. Um, Haley, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you for having me. We had some technical difficulties, but we're here. We made it. <laughs> you know, that's that's my life is is difficulties all the time. So it's fine. Um, no, I appreciate you coming on because you are a like, wealth of knowledge when it comes to GI issues, especially um, and, and hormone issues. So I think you're going to bring a lot of value to the listeners. So can you introduce yourself for those who might not know who you are? Yeah, definitely. So my name's Haley Colanino. I'm a registered dietitian and also a, an online nutrition coach. Um, like Alyssa mentioned, I do spe- specialize in working with mainly women who are dealing with GI discomfort, hormone imbalances, autoimmune conditions, and just really anything related to their internal health that they're looking to manage in a more natural and holistic way. And for some people, that may mean avoiding medication. For some, that means improving quality of life, getting to the root cause of why they feel the way that they do so they can actually start feeling like themselves again. Um, my company is called Girls Fuel LLC. Podcast is the Girls Fuel Podcast. And we have a lot of fun just making sure people, women know how to take care of their bodies essentially for the rest of their lives. Yeah. I love that. I feel like we're we're on like similar wavelengths over here with all that. Yeah. Um, and and she, Haley, I mean not she, but Haley is <laughs> literally like just so knowledgeable when it comes to this stuff. Like I swear, like every time you you post a piece of content, I'm like, yes, like <laughs> louder, louder for people in the back. Um so before we we hop into today's podcast, we're kind of just gonna, you know, cover a few different topics regarding you know GI health I feel like that's one of the most commonly asked questions that I get about you know just like GI issues in general um I feel like so many people struggle with GI issues and don't actually realize that it's that it's a GI issue (laughs) or um you know they'll try to just take a probiotic and like you know do do all the the things that they see online and it's actually not getting to the root cause so we're going to kind of talk about some common GI issues that we see with our clients. Um, We'll talk about, you know, how to get to the root cause and we'll kind of, you know, just ask Haley all of the, all of the questions that I typically get from people regarding GI issues since we have her. Um, Before we hop into today's episode though, we will share a win and a 1% better for the week. So Haley, would you like to go first or do you want me to go first? Okay, you go first. I'll go, okay. So I asked Alyssa if my win had to be health related because I don't necessarily have one of those, but my win for the week is that I rescued a kitten that was left in the middle of a main road. I have named her Jade. She's a little black kitten. She can't be more than four weeks old. Um, I'm in Tampa, Florida. So if by the time you hear this, I still have her. If anyone would like to adopt her, hit me up, but she's fantastic. Um, That's my win. As far as something to improve on for next week, probably be more consistent with tracking my macros. I took a nice break from tracking. I intuitively ate for like a year and a half, but I am going to be working towards my own physique goals again. So getting back to that has been a little bit of transition, but that's what's going to happen. For sure. I feel that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I feel like when like you take a break for a while, it's it's so nice and it's so needed, right? Because like you're not supposed to be tracking forever, but like if you do have specific goals, you're like, okay, we got to, we got to tighten things up a little bit in the in the realm of nutrition yeah that's where we're at so it's fun also I'm gonna laugh if like in the next couple of weeks you just end up keeping the cat (laughs) so I'll say this because I don't think my boyfriend will necessarily listen to this because he hears my voice enough I really want to I'm like trying to be very emotionally stable about this I'm not gonna lie I bawled my eyes out the night that I found her because I was like how could somebody abandon her in the middle of the road because apparently that's something that people do especially living in Florida if you know Florida you probably can understand that so I I want to but I'm really hoping that my mom and my stepdad will take her they live down south Florida and we're visiting in a few weeks so I'm trying to make that happen so like either way dropping. I'll get to be in her life so yeah Dro- dropping those subtle hints like hey mom <laughs> no my mom wants her 
My stepdad, mm, not so much. They lost one of our childhood cats recently. So he's having a hard time with it. Oh. And she's like, no, I just want to love something. So we'll see what will happen. But either way, I'll be, you know, fostering her for the next few weeks and making sure she grows strong, gets all her vet stuff taken care of and all that fun stuff. It's been a lot, but fun. <laughs> oh, you're such a saint. I know it's, it's so sad when they just, I don't, I don't, I don't understand how people can just dump, dump anything well, on the road. That's what I'm guessing. I mean, I was on a main road, like by shopping plazas. There was no neighborhood. So I'm like, where the heck else would she have came come from? I literally like stopped in traffic and like jumped out of the car. My friend was in the car. She was like, what are you doing? And it, I got her. Well, I'm not going to just leave her there. Um, oh my God. Yeah, so, so she is doing really good. She's thriving. I love her. Oh, poor baby. Well, I'm glad that she's in, she's in good hands, which is good. <laughs> Um, my, my win from this week is also just, I survived the week. Like it's, it's been a week, man. My, my husband just graduated. We had like family in town. Like I was hosting all week and then I didn't get much sleep getting back into work. I'm like, what is happening? Um, so yeah, my, my, my brain is just fried and like, there's men TVs happening this week. And we're like, yeah, we're just, we're just surviving. It's surviving. Right Are now. you? In your luteal phase, because I always have no. more mentees in my luteal phase. No, the 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 period just passed. Like we're like heading into ovulation, which like usually I'd be feeling so much better right now. And I'm <laughs> just like, no. <laughs> but it's probably just because lack of sleep. I had like, you know, more alcohol than I typically do. Like, you know, all, all the things that affect your mental health. Um, and so I'm sure once I just like rest this weekend, we're gonna feel so much better. So that's like my one percent better is. Like I want to rest and catch up on sleep this weekend or like this week coming up um, and get back into the gym because I haven't been to the gym now in like two weeks because just life. I get that for sure. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, let's, let's, let's rock and roll and get, and get back into the gym because I miss it so much. And I think it'll help with the, the men TVs that we're having right now. It always does. It always does. Okay, so um, let's let's hop into into all the nitty gritty stuff. So tell us a little bit about like how we got here. You know how what brought you to like wanting you know to work with people who have GI issues, hormonal imbalances, all that fun stuff. Yeah, definitely. So it's a little bit of a long story. I'm gonna try to make it pretty short. Um, I have been coaching online since 2018. Before that, I was personal training. I started personal training, you know, as young as I could. I think I was 18 when I when I got certified and started learning more about that. And I was training people in college and then in a gym. And as I was studying nutrition, I started coaching people nutrition wise in person. And in 2018, I was like, oh, wow, people do this online. Like, hell yeah, let's go left the old whole gym job. You know, if those of you are personal trainers that are listening, I'm sure you remember those fun hours. So left the gym job and I started my own business. But at that time, you know, it was the generation of if it fits your macros and tracking and reverse diets and diet breaks, which is great. We still need all of those things. Um, but that's really the extent of my coaching, what that was for, for a good while. And then I got hired by a team. I was an assistant coach for just about three years. And that team also mainly focused on the physique standpoint of things, fat loss, reverse diet. And I'm not saying I don't focus on those now, but that's not the only thing, you know, you get it that I focus on. Yeah. So towards the end of my stint um, with that team, that's when I started realizing that more and more I was having these client cases and so were some of the other coaches on the team that I oversaw that we just couldn't get them to lose weight. It was like they were doing everything right. They were going to the gym. They were eating healthy. They were eating vegetables. They were sleeping, but still nothing, right? So mm -hmm. I learned how to read blood work, you know, through through grad school, through my dietetic internship and just like self-taught. When I first started yeah. coaching, I took a lot of online courses. I'm sure you did too through people who are kind of above us in the space. I had a lot of mentors and I learned more and more about functional health. So that's part of why I decided to leave that team because I was starting to put pieces together and starting to do tests on my clients, GI maps, all of that. When I realized, hey, like, yeah, you're a little constipated. You get bloated and you can't lose weight. This is probably significant. This is probably something significant in your GI tract that is causing everything else, right? Because we now know that if you have something going on in your gut or a hormone imbalance or an autoimmune flare or something like that, 
your body doesn't feel safe. And the last thing that's going to happen is weight loss, right? So I just started putting those puzzle pieces together and just dove into studying internal health more and more. I took inter um, endocrinology courses in my master's degree and did a lot of clinical work as well in my internship. So it all kind of just timeline wise blended really well with like when the functional health wave online started in, I don't know what, like 2020, 2021, maybe. Yeah. Um, and, you know, having the education. So from there, I, you know, left the coaching company about two years ago and started Girls Fuel, which is my current company. And I myself around that same time was having a lot of GI issues. And at, at the time, you know, I had just finally put the pieces together for a lot of clients using GI maps, using different testing methods, blood work, you know, all of that. And honestly, tried the doctor go around for literally one doctor and she was like you're on an anxiety med you're probably just anxious you should get a food allergy test and I was like I'm literally good and food allergy tests don't mean anything because yeah I might be sensitive to foods but that is a symptom and I'm sure we're going to dive into more of why that is in a second and I just kind of like laughed at her I was like okay that isn't helpful was going to try to get stuff covered through insurance, but that's fine. So I went through the whole shabam myself and I was like, all right, you know, we're going to order a test. We're going to do all these things. And for reference, my GI symptoms weren't bad. You know, I had a fluctuation between constipation and diarrhea, not diarrhea that like kept me from doing things. But my biggest symptom was low energy and brain fog. Like if you've ever had brain fog, you know that that is unlike anything else, unlike any other type of fatigue. Um, and I was working with a coach at the time for, for bodybuilding stuff. And he was like, your stool's not normal. I was like, yeah. He was like, and you're tired all the freaking time. I was like, yeah. So he was like, let's test. So we decided to do the GI map. And from there, you know, we found a whole slew of issues, which made perfect sense based on my lifestyle previously. So I went through and, you know, did the protocols myself and, you know, since have taken courses and studied the material and taken hundreds of women at this point through different protocols. And when I say protocol, I don't mean like a bunch of supplements. I just mean like their program with girls school was catered towards healing their internal health. So mm -hmm. since making those connections for so many women, it has unlocked their ability to change their body, right? We get rid of the stressor and we are able to see physical change. So that has been honestly the most rewarding thing in the entire world, like teaching women how to advocate for themselves, how to get unstuck essentially. So that way they can actually like enjoy being in their body again versus kind of living day to day in a constant panic of Google rabbit holes. What's wrong? Why am I constipated? Why is there mucus in my stool? Why is my period 10 days late? Right. So that's kind of where it started full circle, you know, online training, online coaching basics into more functional. And that's definitely where I'll stay for, for now. Yeah, for sure. And and I, I love that you were like, cool, well, you're not helping me. Like, I'm going to figure this out myself, which I feel like is, is a lot of us, right? Like a lot of women go see their, their primary care physician, which again, I say this time and time again, like PCPs are there for a reason, man. Like, obviously, you know, we wouldn't have them if we didn't need them, but yeah. like, it's very frustrating when you go to someone who's supposed to be helping you out and you're not getting answers or it's, they're not digging deep enough to actually help you figure out what's happening, which I, I went through similar things as well. Like when I was in my undergrad, I was going to become an RD. I never, didn't actually like finish the RD, like internship and all that fun stuff. Cause I was like, mm, nope, we're not doing that. Um, but you know, like when I was going through all that and like, you know, obviously like learning about nutrition and, and how the body works and all that stuff, I was also dealing with GI issues and like, people were like, well, you know, like you eat healthy, you like know all this stuff, like, shouldn't you be able to fix it? I'm like, yeah, but I don't know what the hell the problem is, right? Like the whole problem is I'm eating well, I'm working out, I'm doing all these things and I'm having these issues. <laughs> like exactly. what is happening? So I, I know you were saying too, like, um, oh my gosh, we, we were just talking about this a second ago and it just slipped my mind. Oh, about um, aller like food allergy tests and things like that. So um, cause I remember I used to try to do like the Everly well, um, yeah. food allergy test, like, okay, like maybe, you know, it's something that I'm eating or, or something along those lines. And, you know, again, like those don't actually help. So in your experience, like regarding food sensitivity, food allergy tests, like why are they not actually helpful? Yeah. So they're for one, not necessarily conclusive, right? 
it can be mm -hmm. helpful for some, like if you experience an like straight up anaphylaxis, then yeah, like you have a food allergy and I'm not invalidating that at yes. all. But when, you know, you go to your doctor and you're like, okay, like I get stomach aches. Um, I'm bloated all the time. Like there's a balloon in my belly. I have weird poop, whether that's constipation, diarrhea, a mix, whatever that means to you. If you've been told you have IBS, your doctor may be like, okay, let's, you know, test you for food sensitivities or food allergies. And we have to remember that an allergy is a response from your immune system, which we know is very, very tied to our GI tract, right? Our immune system exists like 60 to 70% of it in our GI tract. So if you are reacting or sensitive to a food that is very different than being actually allergic to it, right? So a lot of times, you know, when clients have sensitivities to certain foods, or, you know, you might have foods that are like trigger foods for you, it's probably good that you're temporarily avoiding, them, right? Because we need to find out why they're triggering for you, why they might be causing symptoms and fix it. And a lot of times, you know, those, those tests might show that like, yeah, you're having a reaction to this food right now, but that doesn't mean that you can never eat it again. Right. Like I've had clients come to me and they're like 30 foods. And I'm like, what are you, what were you supposed to eat? Like, what do you mean? And yep. they, they get the test back with no guidance. And I'm like, that is horrible. I'm so if that happened to you. I'm sorry, but basically, you know, why that might happen, why you might be having sensitivities to foods is, you know, a couple of reasons, but here are kind of the top three that I see in practice. One would be leaky gut or intestinal permeability. So basically we're going to get our visual brains on for a second. <laughs> this is probably my favorite thing to talk about, but basically, you know, we have our lining of our intestines. So your, your stomach, your, in, your G, GI tract, small intestine, large intestine, all of that, they are lined by epithelial cells, right? Those cells are like the walls, right? They're protecting your GI tract and your immune system that lies in the bloodstream from invaders, right? So when your GI tract, your intestinal permeability, intestinal lining is healthy, the only thing that can pass through that lining is nutrients, right? But when it's not healthy, the tight junctions that keep it together are broken or compromised. And then a lot more than nutrients can flow through into your GI tract, into your bloodstream to be acted on by your immune system. So things like pathogens, overgrowth, bad bacteria, yeast, you know, parasites. And I don't say these things to scare you. It's just the reality of it, right? Um, undigested food particles. And that is often where we get sensitivities, right? And they're more common with foods that contain some type of protein. So I see them a lot with things like eggs, with things like dairy, um, different types of maybe beans or legumes, right? Peanuts are another common one. And a lot of times why that happens is because those protein particles are coming into that impaired intestinal lining and your body is like, whoa, foreign invader creating an inflammatory cascade or in some cases an autoimmune response, which is not what we want because that's how we will actually get <laughs> celiac or, or things like that. And that that takes time, right? But basically your GI tract is compromised. Things are getting in there that don't belong there. Your body is having an immune reaction and that's why foods are going to be irritating. So that's a big reason. And we would just need to figure out why the GI lining is like that and fix it. Another one, and these two can both be occurring at the same time, is going to be low stomach acid or and or low digestive enzyme production. And we can see this on the GI map by looking at elastase, which is a measure of pancreatic enzyme production. Um, I also really like having my clients do a super simple at-home burp test. Baking soda, mix in water, you drink it, it interacts with your stomach acid, you time it, how long it takes you to burp. It's not perfect, but it will be helpful to give us an idea of what's going on. And Back to our immune system again, your stomach acid is a part of our barrier system. It is part of your immune system because not only is it meant to help you digest food, but it's meant to help kill and neutralize pathogens. And low stomach acid is super common. It can happen for a variety of reasons. Chronic stress alone being one of them, you know, under eating, overeating poor quality foods, sodas, alcohols, high sugars, things like that, fried food, which I think a lot of us did in our earlier years, so we didn't know any better. Um, certain medications, antibiotics, there's a whole slew of things. And when you don't have the resources to break down your food, like, yeah, you're not going to feel good. Um, and that's really, really common. These two things can also be symptoms. So the third reason is that there's some sort of infection. 
causing this down regulation of your GI tract, causing this um, inflammation and causing the symptoms. So hopefully that gives an overview of that. <laughs> no, it, it definitely does. Cause I know, you know, I have a lot of women that come to work with me <clears throat> and they're like, yeah, I, you know, I did a, a sensitivity test. I have, like you said, you know, like 20, 30 different foods that I, that I'm sensitive to. And I've just like been avoiding all of them. I'm like, cool. So what are you eating? <laughs> because yeah. if you're avoiding all of these different foods, like that's going to be a really restrictive diet. Like you said, like for, for a long time and oftentimes a sensitivity, like isn't a forever thing. Like you can be sensitive to it for a little bit and then we resolve the issues and like, we can add these foods back in and you're going to be fine and you can tolerate them well. So, you know, like you said, like oftentimes it's due to one of those things, which is so, so common, but like no one typically looks at that, at those things because they're not taught those things. Or they're not, you know, they don't have an understanding of like, hey, you have gut dysbiosis, you have leaky gut. And they're like, cool, what's that? (laughs) Yeah, for sure. And just because you get a list of 30 things that you're sensitive to, if you don't have symptoms to them, realistically, depending on what we find out is actually going on inside of you, you can probably still eat them. And another reason I don't like these tests, kind of like you mentioned, like that's so restrictive. And like, yeah. basically, anytime you go down a Google rabbit hole about GI symptoms, or maybe even your doctor will tell you, hey, do this elimination diet. And it's like, okay, but like, for how long? Forever? Yeah. Because it's not realistic to do forever, partially because your body will get used to it, and you'll still have symptoms. But also, it's so restrictive. And I have so many clients coming to me just petrified to eat. They're like, I don't even know what to eat anymore. Google says don't do this. My doctor said to be FODMAP free. Anytime I eat, I get bloated. And it's like, okay, that's where we want to just take a step back and remember it's not the food. 99% of the time, it is not the food's fault. While it may seem that way, I always try to remind my girls of that. Even if you're having a bad day, remind yourself like, hey, it's not the food. I'm doing everything that I can because they are, right? They have the tools, they have the resources. Um, and as long as you're working towards healing, you know, we can try to take the blame off of the food as much as possible to preserve our relationship with it and hopefully not cultivate so much fear around it. Yeah. And and I think, you know, elimination diets can be helpful for some, yes. but under the guidance of a practitioner or a dietitian or like a coach that knows how to do these things, because, you know, if you're, if you're doing it for a long period of time, we're not actually helping the situation. We're just making you more restricted with your food, more fearful of food. And we start going over some, some shittier things that happen with that route that we don't want. So if you're someone who's like, cool, I am always having to avoid these foods. Like, let's figure out why I think is, is the takeaway here for that. Yes, for sure. Cause we always want as much variety in our diet as possible to make sure we're feeding our gut bugs. Obviously we want nutrient density to get all our vitamins and minerals, but feeding your good gut bacteria is going to be essential. And that's, that's a big reason why I think it's very detrimental for women that maybe have a disordered eating history or have done some of these elimination diets Mm -hmm. for too long. You'll, we'll accidentally starve off some of the good gut bugs that we need, which can actually make digestion worse. So that's why maybe if you did do an elimination diet and you went through a certain protocol or whatever it is, and now you feel worse, your good gut bugs might, might need some love. That's kind of another thing to think about. Yeah. And I want to circle back to, to food variety in a second, because that's super important, but I want you to kind of share, like, why is our GI tract like so important? Like, what is it in charge of? I feel like, you know, people like will hear more and more now that like, you know, our gut is like super important, but why? Why is it important? Yeah. And this makes me think of a <clears throat> post I saw, I think it was on Instagram like last week. And it was like, if your coach or practitioner can't even tell you like what's in the gut, then run. Like your gut is not just your stomach. There is so much more to it. So let's break down the process of digestion. Technically, digestion starts in your mouth. But it can even kind of start before you have food in your mouth. I don't know if you've ever been like in a restaurant and you're like really hungry, borderline hangry even maybe, and you're waiting on your food and you you start salivating or like you're about to take your first bite and you open your mouth and a big glob of drool pops out and you're so embarrassed. <laughs> that happened to me the other day. I don't know what I was eating, but that is basically like an anticipate, in- this is a hard word, your body's anticipating eating and yep. 
for some, especially if your body feels safe, you know, you're not stressed, et cetera, et cetera, your body can anticipate digestion needing to happen and start the digestive process in the mouth, which is the production of salivary amylase. So salivary amylase in the mouth, and hopefully I get all of these specific details correct. I haven't re refreshed the, the nutritional biochem science. Yeah. In <laughs> but um, salivary amylase in the mouth is going to help start the process of digestion of carbohydrates mainly, right? So you're chewing, you're masticating. And from there, we have our esophagus, which is also super important. It's in charge of what gets to pass through and what does not, right? So that's where, you know, if you have some acid reflux, a big issue could be your lower esophageal sphincter, LES, because that's what's in charge of opening and closing and making sure too much stomach acid doesn't come up, but also making sure food doesn't come back up making sure that food gets pushed down, so on and so forth there. So we have our esophagus. And then from there, we get the food into our stomach. And this is where a good portion of our protein digestion occurs because we have the production of stomach acid and things like intrinsic factor. Again, we mentioned stomach acid earlier. So this is where with some clients that do struggle with GI issues and we suspect low stomach acid, we may pull their protein down to a gram per pound of body weight or less just depending on how much they can tolerate. So if you used to be someone that could eat a butt ton of protein, no problem, but now you have sulfur egg farts and your stomach blows up like a balloon when you have a big serving of protein, that's definitely something to consider. Um, so again, in our stomach, a lot happens. That's where we're starting to break down food even further. Some vitamins and minerals are absorbed there, um, but most of our vitamins and minerals are absorbed in our small and large intestine. So again, another little sign that you might have a gut issue if we were looking at blood work. And this is why I often like starting with blood work, especially because we can often get it from our doctors through our insurance. And we can learn a lot about your digestive health by just looking at your CBC and CMP, which are the two basic panels that you, everybody gets, like all doctors run those, right? If we see vitamin and mineral deficiencies, then that it could be a sign that you are not absorbing things properly. And there's a whole rabbit hole if you go down about why that is, but Anyway, we get into your small intestine, and this is where a big portion of the digestion occurs, right? Things are being broken down. Um, things are bile and all of these different, we can call them chemical enzymatic processes are happening. Bile is going to help us digest and break down our dietary fat. It is going to come from the gallbladder and the liver's action. It may be released in the stomach. I can't, that part's, that part's leaving me right now. Stomach, small intestines, you guys get the idea. Somewhere in there, bile comes in. And that's also going to be really help, helpful for excreting and binding things like cholesterol and excess estrogen, which we're going to get to the link to hormone health in a minute here. But you know, large intestines and small intestine, small intestine and large intestine are, are the final ones on our list. And the small and large intestine are where we can see a lot of issues occur because they are almost like a breeding ground for anything, right? Because that's where most of our good bacteria are. Most of our good bacteria live in our large intestine, right? That's the good gut bugs that I mentioned earlier. If you take a probiotic, you're likely feeding those. Small intestine will have a little bit, and that's where you might hear people have like a SIBO or a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, so if we have something impaired in our intestines, you're not going to be fully breaking down and, and digesting your food. So you might see undigested food particles in your stool. You might have intolerance-like symptoms. You might have stomach aches or low, more lower abdomen aches. Um, then obviously our colon is in charge of making sure things leave in the other direction. And I mentioned earlier, you know, bile's role with cholesterol and estrogen. If you're not pooping, you're not getting rid of waste, which I know is obvious. You're like, no shit, really? But when we think of waste, it's not just food, right? There's toxins, there's chemicals, and a lot of it's just environmental. A lot of it's just breakdown product because our body's got to break things down and different things get let off. But another part of it is hormones get recirculated, right? Hormones are excreted in your urine, hence why we can have the Dutch test, but also in your stool. So a lot of times we'll see estrogen dominant I, dominance. And I know I've seen you talk about this in your content a good amount with constipation. Because if you're not pooping it out, it's going to mm, little bits come out in your urine and your sweat, but mostly going to be recirculated into your body. So that's kind of a rundown on the GI tract and some like minor tidbits about possible issues that can arise at, at different points. Um, 
but it all really works in harmony. And there are so many other factors that influence it. Like I'm sure most of you have already realized, you know, you don't sleep well, you probably don't poop as well the next day, you know, you're really stressed and you're anxious running around the house in the morning, you probably miss your poop window and you don't go. So there's a lot of things that influence digestion. And I like to think about the, the gut as the center of everything. I'll often tell people I take a gut centered approach because it really is like if your gut is impaired, you're going to have a hard time fixing hormone health. You're going to have a hard time overcoming Hashimoto's or whatever it is. Um, so that's that's kind of why digestion is important. It's more than just breaking down your food and pooping. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I, and I think that's that's something that, you know, Western medicine doesn't doesn't share either. As you know, like I was, I was talking about this on my stories this morning of, you know, how Western medicine takes the approach of like, they're looking at every system individually, right. Versus like functional or Eastern medicine. Like we're looking at everything as a whole because everything does work together. And if one thing is off, everything else is going to be off, but especially when we're looking at gut health, because yeah. if gut health is off, so much is going to go down <laughs> that we don't want to go down. And so if you're dealing with a lot of these issues, like we have to look at you know, what your gut integrity actually looks like. And that looks like your, you know, habits. It looks like meal timing. It looks like all of these different symptoms that you are actually dealing with, how your poops are looking. Cause like you said, it's not just like, okay, we're pooping out excess food or, you know, like whatever is like waste from food, but it's so much other stuff. Like when I was dealing and I, and I know you said, I talk about this a lot because estrogen dominance is something I dealt with for so long. And one of my biggest symptoms was con like, I would never go to the bathroom. I went to the yeah. bathroom like once a week and I was like, cool, 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 cool. Like, this is normal, right? Like, sure. I don't know. <laughs> not no, normal. that's not normal. <laughs> if you're not pooping every day, I have questions for you. So many yeah. questions. So going back to that, I know you were saying that there is, you know, some, some testing that you do for, via like serum tests. I know we've talked about like GI maps. So what are some like basic labs that someone can get from their doctor to like start, you know, looking at gut health and like things to fix? Definitely. So first thing I always recommend, and most of you listening probably already have one of these um, from the last year or so. If you haven't, you need to go to get your physical, you'll get it regardless. That's going to be your CBC, which is your complete blood count and your CMP, which is your comprehensive metabolic panel. These two, honestly, people I think shit on them because they're what everybody gets when they go to their doctor and they're like, well, there's not enough there. And I'm like, if you know how to read labs, there is enough there, right? So, you know, your CBC, your complete blood count, that's going to show us a lot of what's going on with your immune system for one, which we know is very heavily related to the gut. So our, it will look at your white blood cell count which is super important, right? If we have depressed low levels of white blood cells, that could show either, you know, a recovery phase from an infection or that your body's actively fighting it. Your body's tapped out from lots of infections. Yeah. If your white blood cell count is high, you know, that could also mean, you know, active infection, inflammation in the body, et cetera. But then also in the CBC, we get a breakdown of things like our neutrophils, our lymphocytes, our basophils and our monophils, which are our, our, our white blood cells. They're little white blood cell warriors. I like to think about them as and discrepancies in those, whether they're high or low, that could tell us something about what's going on with your intestinal health. They could show inflammation, liver issues, which again, liver, gallbladder, those go hand in hand. There are accessory organs to digestion, which I didn't really talk about that clearly. So there's that. Um, so that that is really helpful. The CBC will also show deficiencies, anemia. So it will show if you have a macrocytic anemia, which is a B vitamin deficiency, usually B12, B B96 kind of thing. Um, it could show iron deficiency or microcytic anemia based on what your your markers are looking like. It can also show, you know, platelets and blood count and blood volume and all of that. And all of those things give us pieces to your puzzle, so to speak. I always say that um, as to what might be going on internally, right? Because I've honestly never seen somebody with a crazy white blood cell kind of profile not have GI issues. Right. So that's a lot of times when I get a client coming to me and they have the symptoms, their labs are concerning. I'm like, we need to test. We need more testing. We need a GI map. But that's not always the case. Right. And then our comprehensive metabolic panel. So this shows us a lot more about obviously our metabolic health, but also our accessory organs. So things like, you know, kidneys, liver, 
Um, how are those things doing? How are, to a degree, your adrenals doing? How is your fluid balance? Because we'll see sodium, potassium, chloride, all of that. We'll see, are you having any acidosis or alkalosis? So that can give us uh, an intake of stomach acid levels. Um, there are other markers in there that can show us how we're digesting protein, which is huge for assessing stomach acid levels. We already talked about low stomach acid. That's, you know, medical term is hypo hypochloridia. So things like our total protein, our globulin, all of those things, if, if they're abnormal, that can tell us something about how your body is breaking down or not breaking down and absorbing protein. It could also show us maybe you're just not eating enough protein, but if you are and those are off, there's an issue in the in the breakdown. So you're going to get those no matter what if you go to the doctor for for your for your yearly, right? And then, you know, we can get more broad from there. Basically, anything in our lab will show us information about our digestion, right? Cholesterol panel. Again, we talked about this earlier. If you're not excreting cholesterol, even if you're eating really healthy and you're fit and you're and you're lean, you're not overweight, you can still have high cholesterol. That can show stress in the body. Again, you might not be recycling it correctly. You might have a bile issue, um, medical history and like dieting history plays a big factor there as well. Um, we could do an iron panel to again, confirm if we're having any type of anemia deficiency or even high iron levels can show, can show inflammation. And those are some things that doctors will usually, usually test for. Um, and then we could go into talking about hormones and thyroid and all of that as well. But those are the basics that can tell us basically everything we'll need paired with your symptoms to tell us, Hey, like, do we need advanced testing? Do we want to add in some additional support? Do things look good? And it's just a motility issue. That's like not progressed into anything worse yet. Where are we at with that? For sure. Yeah. And I want to go back a little bit to, um, GI maps. Like at what point are you running GI maps for your particular clients? Like we have, we have all the basic testing. Cool. Like now when do we need like additional testing? Definitely. So I don't require blood work for my clients. Like if clients come in and they don't have blood work, we'll kind of just evaluate if it's necessary or if we are going to dive right into GI maps. Um, for reference, I would say a good chunk of the women that come to me already know what GI map testing is. And they're like, Hey, I've heard you talk about it. I've been dealing with this forever. I want to order it right away. And I'll still look at their symptoms and be like, Hey, I think we can hold off. Or yes, like I'm with you. Let's do this. This is the cost, whatever. And it, it definitely depends on symptom severity, but also the person's lifestyle, right? I'm sure you can, you know, agree with this. We'll have clients sometimes that come to us and they're not necessarily mastering the basics, right? They may be struggling with sleep. So only sleeping four or five hours a night. Maybe they have, you know, a busy schedule, stress is through the roof. They're not eating properly. So we'll, we'll master the basics first, regardless unless their symptoms are truly like that concerning. Um, but usually I do like a priming phase. So the first one to four weeks is a primer. Like, let me ne get to know your body. Let me get to know your symptoms week to week, how you feel through at least one menstrual cycle, if you get it. Um, a little bit more about like what can change based on implementing the basics and some general supplemental support. Not everybody gets G GI support supplementally to start, but most do just because usually with all my questionnaires and stuff, I can get a good hypothesis of what's going on um, and start from there. And then it's just an ongoing conversation to where if for those for that good chunk of clients that comes in and I'm like, based on your questionnaire right now, I don't know that you need a test. And how I differentiate is if I think somebody's going to have an infection, then they probably need a test, right? So Again, you know, in those first couple of weeks, assuming we decide not to start with testing and it's, it's a conversation that we have, right? We're just trying to see if we can change variables within their diet and within their supplements, within their lifestyle that will cause incremental changes in the right direction. And a lot of times they will, right? So that's where, you know, most of my clients see big improvements in the first month. From there, you know, if we get to a standstill and we're like, all right, you're feeling better, but your poops are still really weird. Let's do the test. Or if it's a few weeks in and I'm like, all right, girl, we, we need to do this. We'll do it. I don't know if that's helpful, but it is truly up to the individual. And we also take like their budget into account. I don't ever require testing, but there are times where I'm like really driving it home that we need it. And others where I'm like, hey, we could probably hold off right now. Yeah, for sure. 
And I think going back to, like you said, the basics, like a lot of people aren't mastering the basics and they're dealing with all of these issues. Like, I think it's hormones. I think it's gut. Like it it has to be something that's off. And then we look and it's like, okay, like, like you said, we're sleeping four or five hours. We're probably only getting like 10 grams of fiber daily. We're under eating. We're overtraining. Like all of these, these things that are affecting, you know, the, the integrity of your internal health in general. So I talk about like my basics, but I want to hear from you. Like, like what are like your, you know, basics of internal health? Like what should like someone like be mastering? Definitely. Yeah. So big one is going to be meal timing. So making sure that they are able to make time to eat at least three balanced meals per day. It will vary person to person, whether we're tracking macros or not. Not all my clients do. A lot of them will at least, you know, do periods of intuitive eating with me um, or different methods of food logging if they don't want to do an app, but making sure that they're actually able to prioritize that. Because like you mentioned, you know, a lot of times we have GI symptoms because we're not eating enough. We're going too long without eating. And when we do eat, maybe we're overeating because we're so hungry that our body's finally just like, whoa, she's eating. Let's keep going. Right. And that can present with issues, right? You're going to get bloated if your biggest meal of the day is right before dinner. You're going to feel backed up if you're only eating 900 calories a day. So usually I'm like, all right, let's get at least a reasonable amount of calories inside of you. We'll manipulate, you know, your food choice based on what we've both collected your symptoms are. It's a very collaborative process. Um, So those are going to be two big ones, you know, depending on where the person's starting, making sure intake is reasonable. Um, and, And that looks different for everybody. I won't push everybody right up to maintenance because for some people with GI issues, that'll just make everything worse. Um, And then also making sure like, hey, are you actually prioritizing your meals? We'll also talk about, hey, can we slow down when we're eating? Like, are you actually chewing your food? If do you eat in a stress state often, like, are you rushing between things? I mean, I work with a lot of people in the medical field, some nurses, doctors. So (laughs) that's obviously something that is hard for them to do, like eat with your butt in a chair. So we at least say, hey, can you take two deep breaths before your meals? Like, that's literally it. Let's try to get you more in a parasympathetic nervous system. So usually once we've gotten them like, eating more, we're like, all right, let's add the deep breaths. Everybody adds the deep breaths at one point in their journey until it becomes just like second nature to regulate your body a little bit before putting food inside of your mouth, at least 90% of the time. So those are a couple of the basics. Um, We often will pull gluten and dairy right away if GI symptoms are significant, just because those are often triggers for people who have intestinal issues and all of that. So if they're, if it's feasible for their lifestyle, we'll talk about how they can make those changes. Like we'll look at their meals together and talk about, well, Hey, this is what you used to like to eat. This is how you can eat it now without those things. This is how your family can eat it X, Y, Z. So we'll, those are two I'll pull out. Alcohol is another big one. We'll, we'll try to go depending on their lifestyle, a couple of weeks without drinking and be like, yo, is this a big part of your issue here? Right. Because it often is. Um, And we'll just kind of test these things out for periods of time. Obviously, we already talked about sleep. So we'll talk about sleep hygiene. You know, what do you need to do before bed in order to actually be able to turn your brain off in order to actually get your butt in bed at the time that you want to, to get, you know, seven and a half plus hours of sleep. That's another big one. Um, Those are probably the biggest non-negotiables. It depends on the personality from there. Like if I have somebody that's just such a stress cadet, which like I get, I've been there where you're just so wound up all the time. Your mind's always racing. You're super, super anxious and overwhelmed easily, jumpy, like high cortisol symptoms. That's the vibe we're going for. We'll work on that immediately from the get-go, whether we're testing right away or not. Um, Food quality is obviously another one, but once they're in a good place with like, hey, I can nourish my body, you know, I can make sure that I'm getting vegetables, I'm getting fruits, and we'll give them like suggestions for like, hey, what about these vegetables going to be better for detoxification going to be better for this. I'll often add herbal teas in to support motility and just do some basic like food fiber swaps in the first few weeks as well. So those are really my basics, I would say like food quality and meal timing, stress management and sleep are probably the big ones. Obviously, exercise and movement go into that as well. I find with the girls that I get, that isn't necessarily an issue. I more so have the issue where I'm trying to get them to exercise less. Um, But for some, it is, you know, let's make sure we're adding little walks in at least once a day, but ideally, you know, a couple times to get your, get your bowels moving. We'll add other like 
free things like bowel massages and squatty potties and all of those other fun things from there too. Yeah. And I know we, we talked briefly about, um, food variety. And so why is it super important for us to have variety in our meals? I know there's a lot of people who will you know eat the same meal day after day. Like this is when I meal prep. These are like the, you know, the three meals that I rotate in and out all the time. because it's easy for me to stick to, yeah. which I get. And then I have a lot of clients who, who do this too. And like, we have to have the conversation about food variety. So why is like variety in your meals important? Yeah. So it's important because if you're eating the same things over and over again, especially depending on what they are, you're going to be significantly underfeeding and eventually starving a population of your gut bacteria. So with that, I don't recommend, you know, changing your diet entirely overnight, especially if that sounds hor- horrifying to you. Usually with my girls that are eating the same things, because it is easy, we'll just talk about, okay, you know, you make your overnight oats every week with blueberries. Can we try raspberries? Okay, great. You do peanut butter. Do you like any other nut butters or any other fats? We think about addition instead of subtraction. Oh, you know, you don't have any seeds in your smoothie. Can we add flax seeds? Can you add a handful of spinach? Or you eat broccoli every night? Okay, can we try, you know, this frozen veggie blend that is at your local superstore? So we'll talk about, you know, where they shop, what they order when they eat out, all of the nitty gritty of that. And depending on where you're at with it mentally, it'll be a more of a slow progression of changing things up and adding variety. But for for others, you know, we'll just talk about they're just some people are just like, I don't know what to eat. Like, I literally don't know. This is why I eat the same thing. So we we brainstorm, we bounce ideas, you know, I'll share what I eat. I have a bunch of recipes that I'll I'll give to clients or, you know, they'll share with each other in the group and stuff like that. So yeah, that's always helpful. Yeah, I, I take the same approach with my clients as well. I'm like, we don't we don't have to just like all of a sudden switch every freaking thing that you're eating up. But like, let's just take the basic recipes that you're already eating and like how can we just swap some things out like you you eat chicken all the time cool like is there another protein that we can try instead of us doing rice all the time can we try like quinoa or like another grain or you know swap out the veggie source like there's so many different ways that we can add variety to your meals without necessarily like changing up the whole like base of your meal right like if you're like like this is what I have to eat because it's easy for me like maybe we're in a pinch this is what the easiest thing for you to like meal prep is the whole week. That's fine. Like, let's just find little ways to switch it up. Yeah, for sure. Basis. Like, even if it's just a weekly basis where like we switch things up, like that's better than eating the same thing for, for days on end or for weeks on end, months on end, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I catch myself falling into it too. Like you just get in the habit of buying the same things at the grocery store. You already know how you prep them. You already know how long they take to cook and all those things. So that's where I find it to be a little fun game every once in a while just to switch something out. And sometimes, I, you know, you still go back to your basics, but I think about it as you're just building a bigger menu for yourself. So now it's like, oh yeah, I love this meal that I've made for years, but now I also have another variation of it that if I want to, I can make that too. Yeah, for sure. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add that we've talked about already? You mentioned probiotics. So I thought yes. that was- you know, good last thing. So we were talking about good gut bugs. Basically, what we're thinking about are those bacteria species that are fed by our food, but mainly our foods that contain pre and probiotic fiber. So if you are not eating those foods, your gut bugs are going to be compromised. Um, There are also, you know, GI maps I get back where the main reason why they're having symptoms is because they have zero good gut bugs to actually process their food to help their immune system to help their mental health. So there are so many benefits of supporting your good gut bacteria. But I will say I don't have every client take a probiotic, just because probiotics, in my opinion, thrive just based on the environment that they're in. And there are just times where you just don't need one, like it's just not necessary for you to buy one, depending on what your symptoms are or aren't what your diet is or isn't. Um, but typically, you know, there's the whole thing where I have had clients say, you know, oh, you know, I was having these symptoms. So I just tried a probiotic and it felt, I felt better at first, but then I felt worse or I felt better for a few days, but then it was back to, back to the same thing. So I will say for most people, not everyone, but most people, a 
adding a probiotic on its own isn't going to be enough to resolve your symptoms. Well, they can be helpful, and I will use them when somebody has a lot of symptoms. They usually aren't a fix. For some, they are. Like if, you know, the biggest thing you're struggling with is low gut bacteria, if the biggest thing that you're struggling with, you know, is possibly just a little mild bit of inflammation, like you're at the start of a cascade of horrible gut stuff, right? They can be super helpful. Um, and there are a bunch of different kinds. So if you were to go on Amazon or whatever you use and search probiotic, the main types you're going to find are going to be blends. So lactobacillus bifido blends are the most commonly used and they are fantastic. So these bacteria, if you were to Google that right now and just look at the label and see the different like lactobacillus this, bifidobacterium this, those are the types of bacteria that we can mainly get from fermented foods and again, prebiotic fibers. So things like onion and asparagus and stuff like that. Um, and they are super important for so many things, you know, the development of our immune system, preventing diarrhea, they can help with our mental health, they can be great for lactose intolerance, general, general intestinal support. So if I have somebody that's like, hey, I don't really have any issues, but I want to take a probiotic, if I feel like it wouldn't be harmful, that's the kind I'm going to recommend. However, if you have GI issues, if you have any symptoms of like a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or a SIBO, so that's kind of what we talked about earlier, where you're having a lot of bloating, you're having a lot of gas, you're having maybe reflux or stomach aches or atypical stool, um, brain fog, you know, things like that. I would not recommend a lactobifidal blend. And this is unfortunately where a lot of people go wrong because we don't know any better. We Google probiotic and that's what comes up um just because if you do have any type of overgrowth it can feed it more right because mm -hmm. if we have overgrowth a lot of times it is those lactobacillus then the bacteria that are overgrown so that's where when clients come to me having a lot of digestive issues i'll use i have a top two either a spore-based bacteria and those are usually strains that are going to start with bacillus um, and I like these a lot because one, they can survive harsh conditions. So say we end up needing to do a protocol where we're using herbs like oregano and garlic and different things, neem that we're killing off bad bacteria, bad yeast, have say whatever, spore-based, just like the other one that we'll talk about, can survive. They can thrive. They can keep supporting your good gut bugs. They can keep supporting your immune function. Um, they can They can make sure that your intestinal health stays in a better place, all things considered. Um, and I really like the spore-based ones for my girlies that are a little bit more constipation dominant or that tend to struggle with immune function. My other favorite, and this is probably my all-time favorite because I use it the most, is going to be Sac Goulardi, which is a yeast-based probiotic. Yes, you can still use it if you have a yeast overgrowth. Um, I love this one. It's probably the most researched one that there is um, besides lactobifido, I would say. It's just great for overall digestive health. It can reduce loose stool or diarrhea, although I do use it with constipation cases. I honestly started getting constipated again a few weeks ago, and that was the first thing I did was add a sac boulardi because um, it can reduce inflammation in the GI tract significantly. It's great for people that have like IBD-like symptoms, diverticulitis-like symptoms. It's great for H. pylori and those that have a low immune function. So we see that low secretory IgA. Um, and it's another one that can survive harsh conditions. So it can be great while you're on an antibiotic or doing an antimicrobial. So that's, you know, my, my take on probiotics. Are they necessary for everyone? Absolutely not. But can they be a really, really beneficial? Yeah, you just want to make sure you're using the right ones at the right time. And also, you know, monitoring symptoms. So anytime I add a probiotic for someone, um, I'm making sure I'm not adding any other supplements at the same time. Typically, it depends on the person. Like if I've known the client for a while and they're not at all sensitive, we may throw multiple in at a time. But especially if you are more sensitive to supplements and things like that, I wouldn't add anything else in, you know, take the probiotic with or just before like 20 minutes ish, ideally before a meal. That's not realistic for most people. I just take mine with my meal because I'm never going to remember to do it before. And it's fine. It's literally just fine. But just just take it and monitor symptoms. You know, some people will have mild discomfort immediately after. Um, if you have anything like a diarrhea or worsening of your digestive symptoms that happens, it just might mean that that's not the strain for you. Um, I say it happens, but it's rare when I'm recommending one. So that's my two, two cents on probiotics. I would say just make sure you're reading into it. Um, and make sure you get a full understanding of what might be going on before just adding one.
Yeah, for sure. I, I see that commonly of people just like, you know, adding, um, you know, a general probiotic and they just grabbed off off the, the market. That's a lactobacillus blend. And like, I don't know, like I'm adding a probiotic. This is supposed to be helpful. I'm like, ah, well, if you're dealing, Actually. if you're dealing with, you know, some type of like gut dysbiosis or overgrowth, like it's not, I use SACB all the time for like my clients who are, who are dealing with that too. Cause it's, it's the easiest one to help them get some good, but good gut bugs without creating their symptoms or making them worse. I should say, um, yeah. Real quick, pre and probiotic rich foods besides like onions, garlic, asparagus, like what are some other ones that they can quickly add in? Yeah. So you're going to want to be careful with fermented foods if you have gut issues. So fermented Mm -hmm. foods, think pickled onion. A lot of people think kombucha or kefir or kimchi and these things. If you're having a lot of GI issues, again, especially if you're mirroring SIBO, you're going to want to avoid those just because- Fermentation is what makes that bacteria grow, and we do not want to further that. So those foods are going to be great when your gut is healed and when you're working on repopulating your your good gut bugs. But you know, typically a lot of prebiotic, I mean, we'll go probiotics first. Probiotics are in a lot of different things. Um, again, they're in fermented foods, they're in dairy. Dairy is probably the first thing that a lot of people think of, yogurts and milks, but They're also, you know, in certain types of chocolate if they're bitter or we already talked about pickled food, um, things like sour cream, you know, and and things like that. So we may have to be careful with oral intake of probiotics while we're killing off an infection. And that's why some supplementation is essential. Prebiotics um, are also going to be really great. We're going to need these to help our body feed good gut bacteria to help feed short chain fatty acid production, metabolic rate, literally everything. So bananas are actually a really good one. Garlic is another fantastic one. Also has so many immune system benefits, berries, oatmeal, legumes, like different seeds. So flax seeds, pumpkin seeds, all of those things. Uh, um, Asparagus, I already mentioned, I love asparagus. So that's why I keep bringing it up. But things like leeks, um, which is kind of, I guess you could say like an onion based on how it interacts with food. And then Different fruit as well will have pro- prebiotics. So peaches, grapefruit, things like certain types of grains will have pre and probiotics um, as well. So wheat has a good amount of prebiotics. Some people tolerate it. Some people don't. Um, cabbage is going to have both pre and probiotics. Apples is also going to have both of those two things. So it's really, you know, look for things that have color for the most part. Um, and you'll be able to get some extra free and probiotic rich foods in there. Another thing that you can do is you can eat resistant starches, which basically all that means is taking a carbohydrate, something like rice, oats, potatoes, cooking it like you normally would, and then letting it cool. So think meal prep, you can still warm it up again. So if you make sweet potatoes tonight, you want to heat them up for lunch tomorrow, boom, you just made a resistance starch, that's going to feed your good gut, good gut bugs directly. That The idea is the way that that type, the fiber is changed after it's cooled, the way it's digested, it resists digestion up until it gets to the large intestine where your gut bugs can directly feed on it. Same idea with rice, cook it, cool it overnight. Oats are a great, a great option for that as well. Um, those are something that I'll often have clients do, especially if we are in a gut protocol, because for most people, things like a sweet potato, oatmeal and rice are very well tolerated, even when we're having GI issues and we need to avoid fermented foods. For sure. Uh, that's really good to know about the, the cooking. I didn't know that one, the cooking of, of oats and rice and like letting it cool. I will keep that one in mind for sure. Um, okay. Awesome. You have been super helpful, like giving us so much insight. We can talk like literally for hours about this. Yeah. And then we might have to do like a part two. Um, but if someone could take like one thing away from this episode, what would it be? Oh my goodness. Okay. What would it be? Well, <laughs> for, for reference, let me ask you a question back. Where would you say, you know, most of your audience is at? Like, do they know they have something wrong with them, but they don't know why, you know, do they not have any idea and they don't know why? I don't know. Yeah. Where would you say they are? I would say, yeah, like they, they, they're just dealing with all of these symptoms and they have no idea what, when, where, why, how. Yeah. So 
if that's where you are, you probably feel like you've spent so much money and tried so many different things. What I'm going to suggest is strip it way down and just do the basics for a few weeks. Like, obviously, there are going to be certain supplements that are helpful, but I would really just focus on your stress management. And I would really focus on slowing down and chewing your food, making sure you're getting enough water and electrolytes, but not drinking too much water during your meals, sip during chug between if if you want to, um, you get the idea, make sure you're sleeping and all of that and, and kind of clean slate it from there. You know, if you still feel like you're not seeing improvements, which is possible, but you won't, you know, that's definitely not going to fix everything for most people. I would recommend reaching out for help. Like, honestly, that's, that's going to be the biggest thing. I mean, I've had other health issues that I didn't really share on this podcast related to like insomnia and anxiety and sleep. And for so long, I self-medicated and I did things on my own. I spent hours up at night wondering what was wrong with me. And I wished I'd went to a doctor for it sooner because, you know, doctor psychiatrists, they were the right person to help at that time. So that's where, you know, I'm a very big believer in if you don't know something yourself and if you don't necessarily have the tools to figure it out, like you don't have a nutrition degree, you know, you don't have all of that in your toolbox necessarily hire help. I know it costs money, but it's always worth it if you find the right person. And if you're following Alyssa, you're already there. So definitely, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help, but never stop advocating for yourself. Like you've probably been told by so many people, maybe even your loved ones, like, hey, you're just, it's just in your head, you know, there's nothing wrong, you just have this, you just need that X, Y, Z, like, you know, your body best. And if there's something really wrong, you know it. So don't let anybody else prove to you or make you think that you don't. That was kind of three in one, but (laughs) that that was beautiful. That was like a great, a great take home. I appreciate it. (laughs) Okay, I will leave all of Haley's info of where you can find her in the show notes, your Instagram podcast, I'm missing anything else. No, nope, that's things? really it. Okay. <laughs> I will leave her Instagram and her podcast in the show notes. Um, but Haley, thank you so much for, for coming on here and sharing all of your wonderful knowledge. I appreciate it. Thank you. This was so much fun. Yay. Uh, well, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please go ahead and rate the podcast and share it with your friends. This always helps us out. Um, please make sure to check out Haley's Instagram and her podcast. She has even more knowledge that she's shared all the time and we love it. Um, But I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and I will see you guys in next week's episode. Bye. Bye.